Hey you all, and good morning. Carpetbagger here, coming to you from a very cold and chilly Louisville, Kentucky. And I'm packed up in the car, ready to head to the next location, whatever that location may be. Let's check the polls. All right, and with 47% of the vote, the winning city is Nashville, Tennessee, so we will begin to head in that direction. Uh, coming up second was Paducah, Kentucky with 34%, and Springfield, Illinois with uh, 19%. So we will travel to Nashville. We will uh, probably spend a day in Nashville after that, and then... Uh, you guys will be able to vote on what city I travel to next. And you're gonna to wanna to stay tuned to the end of this video when I will reveal the next cities that you are able to vote for in the Choose My Adventure road trip. Now, there is a bit of bad weather creeping across the country. I, I, uh, I pulled up the weather this morning and it looked like there was a bunch of snow and bad weather coming from this direction and then another cluster of snow and bad weather coming from that direction. I'm right here in the middle and it's all coming this way. So um, we will kind of play it by ear. I have uh, no intention of abandoning the road trip. No intention of uh, of trying to uh, uh, I'm trying to just say, ah, forget this. But uh, we'll, 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 we'll play it safe. We're not gonna take any unnecessary risks. I uh, said I did see some, some really horrible flooding uh, back uh, in Gatlinburg. So that was very disheartening to see. But uh, we, will, we will play it safe with the weather. If I need to uh, hunker down, if I need to spend a few extra days, if I need to, uh, to lock myself in a hotel room somewhere for a few days uh, in order to, to wait out a storm, I will do that. But uh, we will continue. And you know, if you guys want to send me in the direction of warmth and safety, that's entirely up to you. But uh, that long, lonesome road is f calling, so please, follow me. And we have landed here in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. I did kind of take a detour, as I am wont to do. Um, I have been wanting to stop by Hopkinsville for some time, never actually been to Hopkinsville. So I figured we'd take a little detour to Hopkinsville and wanted to check out this museum here on Main Street. This is the uh, historic museum of Hopkinsville. And uh, let's head inside. I'm always a big fan of stopping by the small museums, the small local museums, and learning about new things, local traditions, local legends, and uh, local unusual history. Now this building is the old post office here in Hopkinsville. You can see the old P.O. boxes right here. Look at this. Yesterday we went to the uh, Kentucky Derby Museum. There's another jockey outfit. Some retro toys down here. Barbie hanging out with her friends. Wonder if they're all named Barbie and Ken like the uh, Barbie movie. And then the Atari over here. I remember my grandmother had this very same Atari. I had the NES in my house, but I would uh, take a break from the NES to play Atari when I went to my grandmother's. Just look around the museum, see the cloud of blackbirds there on the wall. There's more blackbirds over here. It talks about a blackbird invasion in uh, Hopkinsville. And actually, as I was driving into town, I did notice a field completely filled with uh, blackbirds. Now this is a tobacco farming area. See this tobacco barn in the center of the museum. Now I remember when I first started driving through Kentucky, I was always curious why the barns were black. 
other places in the country traditionally have those red barns, but all the barns I would see in Kentucky were black. Now, uh, it says that the reason for that is the, the uh, Kentucky tobacco barns are painted black to help uh, preserve the wood, repel termites, and hide the smoke stains. I guess when they're curing the tobacco, the, uh, the uh, black smoke will stain the barn much like it will stain your lungs and uh, to hide those stains they would have the barns be black. Oh yeah, you can look in there, you see the tobacco dangling and there's a little fire in there curing the tobacco. And check out this over here, this is a genuine Knight Rider mask. Now the Knight Riders were a uh, organization who actually took over the town of Hopkinsville December 7th, 1907, they were disgruntled tobacco farmers that were angry about the uh, the tobacco buying monopoly. Apparently, uh, they were angered that they were offering such low prices for tobacco and there was no, uh, no competition. They only had one buyer, so they actually formed a posse, wore these masks to hide their identities, and held the city hostage as they did uh, the equivalent of six million dollars worth of damage to the cities in these terrifying uh, costumes and masks. There's also a, a rifle left over from the uh, from the raid. Pretty spooky. And here you can vote if you think the Night Riders are heroes or villains. Now I don't know all the dynamics of tobacco politics, but um, I do think, uh, you know, that violence, violence is never the answer. They uh, were violent against civilians, terrorized local people, so I'm gonna say they were villains. Here's something I was not aware of. Hopkinsville is the batter capital of the world. Yeah, look at that. Hopkinsville, Kentucky, batter capital of the world. In addition to producing tobacco, they also make pancake batter. You can see by the giant pancakes here in the museum. Now this little guy over here, one of the main reasons I decided to come out here to Hopkinsville is one of the Hopkinsville goblins. It is a, uh, a local cryptid. It appeared in 1955. Of course there was a sighting of a UFO. You can see the little Hopkinsville goblins there inside their, uh, their UFO. The UFO landed and then 12 to 15 of the goblins attacked a farmhouse and uh, it is said that the, the residents of the farmhouse fought them off with shotguns were blasting them away. It says that the, uh, it would blow them back, it would, it would send them flying, but it said that the bullets actually bounced off their metallic, their strange metallic skin. And um, when this, uh, this news went out, the local authorities are said to have believed the people, said that they did not drink, and that um, they were trustworthy people and were not seeking attention. And uh, when the, the reports of the aliens um, hit the news, it was the first use of the term little green men, although the, the, uh, the original reportings reported them as being metallic, not green. But in the newspaper, they, they, they spun it as little green men from outer space. The, the term little green men has become synonymous with, uh, with aliens. And here's kind of a retelling of what happened. You see uh, Billy Ray Taylor there going out to the well, noticed the UFO. The, uh, the sound of the UFO, the sound of the goblins awoke the dog. You see him howling at the goblins there. They uh, began shooting at the goblins, blasting them, but the, uh, the shotgun had no effect. It would send them flying, but did not, uh, did not kill them. Oh, look at that. You can even see the goblin there uh, reaching down from the roof. It said, reached down from the roof and grabbed his hair. Wow. You can see the police officer there saying, I think the whole story is entirely possible. And then down there, you see the uh, original drawings. This is the, the police report. This is the Hopkinsville goblins. How all the witnesses, there are quite a few witnesses to this. And uh, this is the reports they gave. This is two and a half to three and a half feet tall. 
Hopkinsville Goblins. Believe it or not, then oh yeah, I believe. It seems like a majority of people do. Some nostalgic toys over here. I guess this is Alyssa's time capsule. A resident, Alyssa, a resident of Hopkinsville, shows off her nostalgic uh, time capsule here, her toys from when she was a child. Quite a collection of these uh, Rainbow Bright dolls. See her Adidas shoes. I was reading, reading up on Elf, watching the Viewmaster. This is a true uh, 80s childhood here. That is Alyssa right there, I guess, with her, uh, with her boyfriend there, printed on a T-shirt. Wonder, wonder if they're still together. Here's Heath's time capsule. Down here had his etch a sketch and uh, these pro wrestling trading cards. See Brutus Beefcake there. It's got one of the LJN figures of the Iron Sheik. It's a members only jacket in there. Oh, that's Pee Wee here. I remember this Pee Wee here. This was like the hottest toy for a while. Everyone had to have their talking Pee Wee. It's a piece of folk art here. Carving in the wood of the uh, Trail of Tears. It's the Trail of Tears by George Barrett Floyd, where the Native Americans were removed and sent out west. Carved intricately in this piece of wood. Now this museum is a whole section dedicated to Edgar Casey. He was a, a famous psychic from the area known as the Sleeping Prophet. Now apparently he would uh, make his predictions, make his readings by uh, by going into like a trance. So he would lay on a couch like this. This is a replica of his couch. So he would lay here and um, go into a trance where he would uh, be able to communicate with the deceased or make predictions. Apparently he famously uh, predicted that California would break off from the United States and slide into the ocean, which uh, is a, a claim that I've, I've actually heard repeated by different people that uh, the fault line will cause California to fall into the ocean. Of course, it has not yet happened, and hopefully, uh, hopefully it never will. Now, uh, apparently he also spoke a great deal about the lost city of Atlantis and a lot of what he gave, information he gave in his trances, uh, form some of our modern ideas of what the city of Atlantis was actually like. So apparently, in addition to being a psychic, he was also a professional photographer. There was a, a camera that he would use, and we have some of his other um, his other personal items here, his Bible and other items he would have around his office. Now this is interesting up here. This is the Violet Ray machine. These are uh, the, the glass items there, the different shapes of glass. Apparently these would fill with electricity and he would do therapy on, uh, on his clients with these. Now you see um, there are different shapes meant for uh, different parts of the body. There's like a brush right there that you can run through someone's hair. And uh, you can use your imagination where some of the other things may have been used or, uh, or inserted while being uh, pumped with, uh, with electricity. Now while these items are mostly his, apparently the desk belonged to his doctor, Dr. Wesley Ketchum, and apparently they had a falling out because Dr. Ketchum was apparently secretly using Casey's powers, was abusing Casey's powers for the purposes of winning at gambling, was tricking his psychic friend into helping him win big at gambling. Now right here we have a list of Casey's abilities. He could converse with spirits, deceased as though they were living, so he could talk with the dead. He could see and communicate with fairies and little folk. Well, that's really interesting. You wonder if maybe he could communicate with the Hopkinsville goblins, although I think he may have been passed away by the time the goblins showed up, but that does lend credence that there may be other fairies and little folk in, um, in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Of course there is legends of Appalachian little folk and fairies. I've heard that. Uh, so uh, 
not too not too out there. You could see the aura around a person. You could read someone's aura. You could memorize a book by holding it to his head. Some of the books that are here are actually written by uh, by Casey. Apparently, he could just take a book, hold it against his forehead, and he could learn all the knowledge in that book. That would be a very very handy ability. You could find a lost object in somebody's home by thinking about it, taking a nap. So he comes to your house, he lost your keys, he takes a nap on your couch, and when he wakes up, leave him alone, let him nap, he'll wake up and he'll know where it's at. You diagnose and prescribe therapies for ailments via hypnotic trance. Unfortunately, all the uh, all the uh, the cures were for him breaking out his uh, his uh, glass electrical insertion machine. Um, he could provide personal business advice via hypnotic trance, describe a person's past lives, and this last one's really interesting. It says at least once, his clothing caught on fire for no apparent reason other than he was angry at his father. That's an interesting ability that you're just your clothes catch on fire when you're super angry. Hopefully, he uh, spent most of his life in relative uh, calmness, because uh, you wouldn't like him when he's angry. Some more of uh, his uh, personal items. Here's one of a photograph he took. It's a glass plate negative of a baby. There's his cufflinks there. A dictaphone. He said he would create voice recordings using this dictaphone. And there is a card game that he created called Pit. I don't think I've ever heard of Pit. Has anyone ever heard of the game Pit? If so, leave a comment in the comment section. And here you can vote on if you believe in psychic powers, fact or fiction. Let me see. We'll take our coin and our psychic powers, fact or fiction, you know? That's about equal right there. It looks like I, I like to keep an open mind, so I'm going to put my coin back in the satchel. Over here you can test your own mind reading powers. It says ask a friend to go to either end of this talking tube, spin the wheel and select a picture. Keep the picture a secret. Concentrate on the picture. Think of nothing else. Let's see. You can, oh look at that. You can actually think of the Hopkinsville goblin there. And um, I guess uh, what do you put the two like to put the tube up against your head, maybe? And then uh, Let's see the other end, the other end of the tube. I'll go all the way across to the other side of the museum there. And at the other end of the psychic tube, you see if you can guess which picture your friend is looking at. Over here in the gift shop, you can see the Kentucky After Dark, two of the little green men there. But they used to have a little green men festival nearby here, but I think the pandemic, I don't think it ever started back up after the pandemic. Some Edward Casey <coughs> books here in the gift shop, some of his remedies, and even a protection spell there sealed with wax in the little vial. Here, back behind the museum, do you see a little mural there with the, uh, with the goblin? It says, stay weird, Hoptown. And some additional information on the uh, Kelly Green Men, aka the Hopkinsville Goblins. It does say that the original script for E.T. was called Night Skies, and it was more of a horror movie, and that was actually inspired by the attack of the Hopkinsville Goblins. Also, the uh, Pokemon Sableye was uh, inspired by the uh, Hopkinsville Goblins as well. And there's my Sableye from uh, Pokemon Go. It said actually on the brochure that the movements of Sableye uh, from the game are actually based on um, how the movements of the actual Goblins were described in the police report. You can see it kind of waving his arms there. And the museum itself actually is a Pokemon gym, so I'm going to go ahead and leave a sable eye here at the, uh, the museum. 
So I love to learn more about local cryptids and the Hopkinsville Goblins, uh, one of my favorite cryptids. I think they are like the, the gremlins of the cryptid world, you know, all attacking in a horde, attacking the, the house as a horde of creatures. And I must say, this is a, a, a fantastic local museum. Actually, the full name is the Penny Royal Area Museum here in uh, in Hopkinsville. Um, not only do they have information on the Hopkinsville Goblins, but the uh, special exhibit on Edward Casey, as well as some other very interesting bits of local history. Definitely worth stopping by if you are in the uh, Hopkinsville area. Came out here to Kelly Station Park. This is supposedly the location of where the farmhouse was, where the uh, Hopkinsville Goblin attack took place. But actually it's not in Hopkinsville, it's actually in the neighboring town of Kelly. So technically the Hopkinsville Goblins, not from Hopkinsville, they're actually um, from the smaller town of Kelly, which is just a few miles uh, north of, uh, of Hopkinsville. Now as you see, the, the, uh, the house itself is gone. There is a park here, some playground equipment, and they used, like I said, they used to do a Little Green Man festival here in uh, in Kelly, Kentucky, and uh, that was kind of the precursor to uh, a lot of the other cryptid festivals. You see the, as you, if you follow my channel, you know the cryptid festivals becoming more popular. We've had uh, the Mothman Festival, of course, different Sasquatch festivals, Squonkapalooza, different, uh, the Frogman Festival, different cryptid festivals popping up. The Little Green Man Festival was kind of the precursor to that. And sadly, um, I think 2020, they did not have it because of the pandemic and then just never happened again. So I'd love, I'd love to see the return maybe someday of the uh, Little Green Man Festival. Um, they did used to have a UFO out here at the park to commemorate the landing of the goblins of the Little Green Men, but unfortunately that has been replaced. As you can see there's no longer a UFO here. So we have this circular area, and in the center, we have the Ten Commandments. Yep, they're all there. All right, we stopped off here at Fort Campbell, which is an actual military base here in Kentucky. I wanted to check out, they have a museum here on the uh, military base, so I wanted to check that out. But to, it, it, you can't just drive onto a military base. There's a certain security measures, obviously, for very good reason. So I went to one gate, they told me I was at the wrong gate, got me turned around, sent me over here, I went to the visitor center, and you know, gave them my driver's license, gave them my, um, Social security number got approved to be here. So uh, let's go see if we can uh, check out the museum. And here we are on this massive military base here. You can see all these uh, military aircraft here across the street. And over here we have the Don F. Pratt Memorial Museum. And supposedly they do have some very interesting things inside. All right, and here we are greeted to the museum by these two wonderful figures here. Say so things about envelopment warfare. So we see the different uniforms here. This is the Vietnam War. This is World War II. This is Desert Storm and the Global War on Terror. See the paratrooper here there's some authentic bronzed paratrooping boots here we have a new recruit there getting uh getting dressed he is ready for inspection see his senior officer there giving him a uh, giving him a dressing down the big tank here and it says this is a uh, a fatigue hat says the fatigue hat was nicknamed the Daisy Duke. So this uh, soldier here wearing Daisy Dukes. I, you know, when I think of Daisy Dukes, I think of these small shorts named after the uh, the character from Dukes of Hazard. 
but this says it's named De uh, Daisy Duke after the character from Little Abner, which was a comic book about um, about hillbillies. I don't know, was Daisy Duke from Dukes of Hazard named after Daisy Duke from Little Abner? I I have not. I am not sure. Here is a Japanese World War II soldier. Also have the uh, Japanese bugle there, as well as these katana. Apparently they did use katanas in World War II. Another one of the uh, US's enemies during World War II. This is a uh, German paratrooper. soldier here decked out in some uh, winter gear it says here that uh, US Army is actually often unprepared for very cold weather see here some improvised uh, warm weather gear now this is pretty incredible I guess it's kind of the crown jewel artifact of this museum this walking stick here you see right here this belonged to Adolf Hitler. They uh, retrieved that from his uh, from his eagle's nest, his private residence. These medallions on it, these are hiking medallions. Apparently, I didn't know this, but apparently he was a, uh, he was a hiker. These are the 13 European mountains that he had uh, climbed the top of. I did not know he was a mountain climber, but I guess this was his, one of his prized possessions from all his mountain climbing and now it's here in the United States and uh, he is uh, thankfully no longer here. Yeah, look he is there, right there in that photo he's holding that walking stick right there. That is incredible that they have this in the collection. Wow. Here's a North Korean soldier. So these are North Korean bugles collected uh, on the battlefield from the uh, the Korean War. Now, I, I don't know that much about military weaponry, but uh, this is the infamous Davy Crockett. And uh, what makes this interesting, as you can see from the diagram there, is this was meant to fire a nuclear warhead, but not to drop it from the plane from a plane you could actually just launch it and I guess the reason that this was never used is because because that's a nuclear bomb <laughs> well, obviously there's no nuclear material there but that 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 fired a miniature nuclear bomb like just within a short range so um apparently the the fallout from that bomb proved to be too large so uh, this is, is, is it goes down to history as one of the uh, the worst military ideas for weaponry ever ever conceived. What do you think about that, Tedrick? Some Vietnamese soldiers here. Over here, we can see these soldiers have made a little hut for themselves, a little fort, if you will, out of old. Uh, ammunition cartridges. It's an exhibit on MREs, these uh, prepackaged meals carried by soldiers. It's a World War II era MRE right here. A lot of little different foods in cans. It's a can of uh, meat and vegetable hash. Even comes with a little pack of cigarettes. I guess, um, you know, back then almost everyone smoked, so they just included that as part of their food. Very early on in uh, this channel, I did a uh, MRE review. Someone sent me an MRE, and um, I ate it wrong. Apparently there is usually some sort of heating device, some sort of, like, chemical heating device to warm up the food. I didn't understand that, and I just ate everything cold. And it was uh, predictably non-delicious. You know, this one here is just a big metal tub of glazed carrots. 
Here is an Iraqi soldier during the uh, during the first Iraq war. Over here we have, I guess these are members of the uh, Northern Alliance who are uh, United States allies during the uh, during the Afghanistan war. If you notice in the center of this museum is this giant aircraft here. I think we can actually climb aboard up these stairs into the, uh, the fighting falcon here. Actually go inside the fighting falcon. Oh, watch your head. Oh, oh yeah. See the soldiers there preparing for battle here aboard the, uh, aboard the falcon. point it was really popular to paint uh, teeth on your plane or helicopter. So yeah, I definitely uh, like to stop and see different small museums as I travel across the country. I call that the EM rule that uh, any museum, any small museum has at least one thing, if not several things, that are worth checking out. As you can see, the, the small Penny Royal Area Museum in uh, Hopkinsville was wonderful, even though it was small. And some very interesting things here at the Don Pratt uh, Memorial Museum. I uh, loved all the, all, the, all the figures, all the, the wax figures wearing the different uh, military uniforms. Very interesting. And of course, the, uh, the, the Hitler's walking stick is just, it blows you away to be able to, with your own eyes, see a personal item of someone so notorious and so horrible and so evil with your own eyes. Kind of gives you kind of a sick feeling in your stomach to know that that was a real person and you're looking at something that they handled, something they touched, something that uh, that they cared about. So uh, yeah, and the, and the military museum, the museums on military bases, I also went to the uh, military museum that's on the Fort Bragg base in North Carolina. It's a little more difficult getting onto the military base. Obviously you need to, uh, be uh, allowed onto a military base and uh, you know you have to go through the, the trouble of going in giving your information letting them uh, check you out make sure that uh, you're not uh, not gonna be a problem to be on the military base I'm not crying by the way it's just cold and windy today um, I wasn't uh, I, I, in case you're worried that I was I was moved to tears no it is just the the cold blistering uh, weather out here but yeah the military bases take a little bit of extra effort to get in but um, it's always worth checking out well I think of some of the some of the best museums are are ones that uh, they, they don't get seen a lot because they have that little extra added layer like I said this is a great museum the, the Fort Bragg Military Museum is actually really really amazing that's one of the best uh, military museums not always the biggest fan of military museums with the Fort Bragg uh, Military Museum was very very interesting also the um, the Georgia Bureau of Investigations has an amazing museum that's uh, worth checking out they have the uh, the space the, uh, the the monkey that was mistaken for a space alien there it, it was really crazy stuff but yeah sometimes it's worth uh, going a little, a little above and beyond to be able to see uh, see a museum but we must now depart the Fort Campbell military base as that long, lonesome road is calling. And we have arrived in Nashville, Tennessee. And um, Jen is, is on her way, so uh, she has my medication in hand. So that issue uh, will hopefully be resolved as uh, she'll be arriving here in a, in a few hours. But uh, I got in a little early tonight. It's about five o'clock, which is, for me, that's, that's getting in pretty early I've, uh, I'm lucky enough to uh, to make it here right as the Sun sets over 
Nashville. Now, uh, tomorrow I'll be filming in the city of Nashville, and I need to know. I need to know where you guys would like me to film in Nashville, Tennessee. Please fill up the comment section. Let me know what you would like to see in Nashville. Definitely uh, would like some feedback there, and, and, and definitely looking for ideas of, of interesting things to, uh, to film here in the, uh, in the Nashville area. But then, but then, but then, it is uh, time, it is now time to vote on what city I will be visiting next. Again, you can check, uh, check your subscriber tab. If you're subscribed, the poll will be there. If not, you can go to my YouTube page, click on the community tab, and there will be a poll out where you can vote on what city I go next. And right now, your choices are let me see here. Let's do Atlanta, Georgia, Birmingham, Alabama, and Memphis, Tennessee. So either send me southeast to Atlanta, Georgia, directly south to Birmingham, Alabama, or west to Memphis, Tennessee. Please vote and let me know where I will head next. Tomorrow, I will be enjoying my day in Nashville. The day after that, I will open my phone and I will go whichever city has received the most votes. So thank you so much for you guys coming along. I'm gonna sit down here if you don't, if you don't mind. I'm gonna have a seat. Thank you guys for your support. And um, you know, just as I drive, I think about things and um, I just want to tell you guys, you know, in your life you will get um, a lot of people that will tell you what you're doing is not the right way to do things. Sometimes this is good advice. Sometimes this is good advice to be heated, but um, you got to you gotta look at who's telling you these things. If someone who loves you and understands you is telling you, maybe you need to do things a little different, maybe you should give that a thought. If the person that is telling you what you should be doing is someone that you don't care for, someone that is a negative source in your life, that may be an indication that you don't need to listen. Um, you're, over the course of your life, there will always be people telling you to do things a different way. And it's important you pay attention to who's giving you that information and you stay true to yourself and you listen to those who love you and understand you. Thank you so much for your support. I, uh, I do not take it for granted. If uh, you like these videos, please subscribe. I travel around the country. I film roadside attractions, amusement parks, museums, haunted houses, and other fun stuff. If you'd like to help support the channel, consider contributing to Patreon. $3 or more will get you a postcard once a month from me to you. Also selling enamel pins in the Etsy shop and doing personalized messages on Cameo. If you're interested in any of those things, the information is in the description and of course all those things help keep this train on the track this boat in the water and this dirigible in the air until tomorrow my friends this one's in the bag <laughs>